So welcome everybody um, this afternoon. Um, I'm Sophie Castell, the Chief Exec of Myeloma UK. Um, and thank you very much for joining to hear all about um, Growing Hope, the story behind the Myeloma, Myeloma UK garden at, at Chelsea. Tonight, we're gonna to hear a bit about the backstory of how we ended up with a garden at this year's Chelsea Flower Show. We are gonna hear from designer Chris Beardshaw, and he's going to explain how he took inspiration from people living with myeloma um, to create this beautiful garden for us. We're also joined by Fiona, um, who is an avid gardener and person with myeloma. And she's gonna talk about um, how she's maintained her well-being since her myeloma diagnosis. And finally, we'll be joined by Alice Barron, who is Head of Patient and Carer Information and Support here at Myeloma UK. And she's going to discuss some of our resources and services that will help you nurture your well-being and improve your outlook um, and grow a hopeful future. Um, so we have got a section for questions at the end of the event. Um, so if you've got specific questions, um, please post those questions in the Q&A box. Um, and otherwise, if you just want to introduce yourself and say hi, um, then um, you can do that in the chat. Um, also, keep an eye on the chat throughout the discussions as we'll share some useful links. Um, and those will always also be emailed to you after the event. So let's get started. As you know, um, we at Myeloma UK have been celebrating our 25th anniversary. Um, and to top off our special anniversary year, we were selected and gifted to have a show garden at the uh, Chelsea Flower Show. Um, the gift came via Project Giving Back, um, and they are a charity that launched during the pandemic uh, to champion worthy causes um, and to turn a spotlight on the invaluable work that charities do by funding a show garden for them at the world's most famous flower show. Um, they teamed us up with the amazing garden designer, Chris Beardshaw. Um, and as you'll see, he did a phenomenal job for us. Um, the garden won a gold award, and thanks to the support of many, many people, we also won the People's Choice Award, which really did top off um, the, the week for us. And why is that important? It's important because um, the, the garden itself was there to help raise awareness of myeloma and of Myeloma UK. It gave us a wonderful platform to talk to people, we had MPs, we had donors, we had supporters, we had some senior people from NHS England. It was a really amazing um, platform to just have those conversations in a beautiful place. The garden um, was called a what, what Life Worth Giving Garden, and it celebrated the emotional and psychological health benefits that a garden can bring. Chris created this tranquil, meditative space um, designed to kind of still the mind provide a pause, simply feel and be in the moment. Um, and the garden acts as a reminder of a life worth living. And as we go through this evening, I'm sure you'll see that Chris created just an amazing experience for everybody there. So now we're gonna hear from Chris, our, our designer and Chelsea legend. And you're gonna hear him first of all, talk about um, what inspired him. We asked Chris to tell us about the design, what inspired him and the process he went through to develop this stunning and meaningful garden. Um, and then after that, we'll also be able to share some video of what the garden itself looked like. For me, one of the most important things when embarking on a project like this is that the resultant scheme is intricately linked to the cause in this particular case, intricately linked to Myeloma UK. And so really fundamental in that process of, of ensuring that we're, we're fully meshed and creating a scheme which can only belong to that charity is by really harvesting all of the information that comes out of not just the charity, but by people who are struggling with myeloma and have experienced myeloma or families where a family member has had a myeloma and listening to the stories that they tell, listening to what would have made their life different or what does make their life different, improved and embellished 
is really important. And, and what came out from those varied conversations was really the idea that because myeloma is, is a condition with no cure yet, there is no, in a way, there is no logical conclusion. There is no point of a, a kind of an axial celebration of, a, of an end, if you like, which is what you very often get at Chelsea Flower Show. And you would notice it because the gardens are basically rectilinear and so many gardens represent a kind of straight line path with the celebratory point being at the end of that particular garden and everything migrates towards that garden and we feel as though we've achieved something when we get there and that's one way of, of approaching the creation of a garden but it struck me that the way in which myeloma and the myeloma condition was being described to us it's much more about a transition through the space it's about traveling and slowing the pace rather than marching towards a conclusion it's about encouraging people to consider every step that they take. And in a way that becomes a metaphor for considering every embellishment, every detail and every enjoyment that we have in life. So deliberately we've created a garden that is slightly concealed. On the face, one of the boundaries, the 10 metre boundary on Main Avenue in Chelsea is a floral border, much as people would expect but tucked behind that floral border and only accessed through a little slip path where you have to tiptoe through the border and feel as though perhaps you shouldn't even be in this space into which you're emerging. When you emerge in that space, it's a completely different environment from a sun-blazed, bountiful floral border at the front, suddenly into a dappled shade woodland garden at the rear. And that's the majority of the garden. And the path becomes somewhat curved, a circuitous path. There is no obvious destination for the path. And as we migrate and allow our feet to passage along the oak sets which form the path, we encounter not just varied tapestry of horticultural specimens in all of their guises, it's called mercurial in their shape and form and colour, but also en route we encounter, well, two temples. One is a temple which is really celebrating the all the fragments of life, if you like, that we've experienced, all of those disparate elements that are starting to be drawn together. But this is a relatively muted temple. It's quite pared back. It's quite monochromatic. But from that temple, there are two things which are really key. The first is that within the temple wall is a three dimensional decoration of gold leaf and each gold leaf represents and is actually an accurate cutout of plants within the garden space. So encapsulated within this three dimensional artwork is in a way the perfect replica in miniature of the garden that we're trafficking through. A reminder that the beauty is to be found in the curvature, the veining and the shining of a leaf and the way that those leaves assemble and the way the light casts it through those leaves. And if we turn around and look back out into the garden from the artwork, what we're faced with is a reflective pool, an octagonal reflective pool. And there's a very fundamental reason why it's reflective and why it has to be an octagon. In geometric terms, octagons are related to more rectilinear objects and historically and architecturally, rectangles, squares, octagons, hexagons, they're considered imperfect, they're earthly, they're something which is perhaps slightly out of kilter, they're not quite fully formed. But what we see within that octagonal pool shape is a perfect circle and the reflection is a perfect circle. And the idea behind the reflection is that not only are we approaching this sort of paradise space, the circular space, but that reflection is encapsulating everything in the outside world. In a way, it's like a vacuum drawing everything which is beautiful of the tree canopy and all of the planting which surrounds and the skyscape and the cloudscape and birds flying over and azure blue skies. All of that is encapsulated within the perfect reflection at our feet. And it's a reminder of the beauty of the world around us but also the fragility of the world around us too, because 
as anybody knows, with a perfect reflection in a body of water, it takes a mere droplet from the tip of a leaf on an early spring morning to fall into that reflective surface, into that perfect picture. And suddenly the picture is disturbed and disappears. And that fragility of perfection is really a great reminder of our lives and how perhaps fragile our lives are and how we take our life for granted and that we should enjoy that momentary glimpse of a paradise space. And so from that temple, we continue passage through the garden and end at the second temple, which is where everything that we've experienced is gathered together and harnessed and celebrated. It's a much more embellished and enriched temple. It's a temple where we can sit and reflect on the passage taken. And outside of that temple is a font, constantly overflowing, just gently rippling with water. A reminder that, in a way, that kind of constant cleansing of overflowing water and the sound of trickling water is a great way of distracting ourselves from perhaps some of the, the noise which surrounds our lives. And so from this sort of vantage point at the end of the garden, secluded from everyone and everything, we have the opportunity just to sit, to contemplate, to relax and to reconsider not just our passage through life, but what is important in life. And all of that came from threads and narratives which were given to us by those people who have myeloma. They've given us those nuggets which we've been able to weave together within this one garden space. And that's the beauty of creating a garden at Chelsea Flower Show, is that you know, I'm responsible for sharpening the pencil and doing the colouring in, but it's about drawing on all of those experiences from everyone involved in myeloma to then hone that down and produce a garden which, for anybody who knows about the myeloma condition, when they walk through, it's absolutely relevant. So thank you, Chris. Um, Chris was amazing to work with um, during the design process and during last week. Um, he's an incredibly thoughtful designer and he spoke to lots of people with myeloma and lots of people um, who support who are supporters. He spoke lot, to lots of doctors and nurses. Um, and I hope when we show you the garden that you will see just how much of that insight is, is reflected. Um, so Chris's beautiful design really encapsulates what we here at Myeloma UK have always set out to do, and that is be a safe space for people with myeloma so that people can come to grips with that diagnosis and be a real beacon of hope, support and reassurance. Um, so the show was last week and we are all still on a real high from it. Um, so we've got some images of the garden here in all its glory to share with you. literally blew me away. Um, if I could have my dream garden, it would definitely be this one. It literally makes you feel so relaxed, so chilled. And um, yeah, it's very special. I think that's what Chris has done here, is to provide the most beautiful and rich place in which to reflect on life itself. I love all the blues and the whites together, it makes it feel really crisp and fresh and like really revitalising and really calming as well. It's really pretty, it's my favourite so far. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavour of what the garden looked like. Um, it was an incredible um, week and um, just a couple of uh, my favourites, I think, captured here. 
um, in the centre, a couple of our amazing volunteers. We had so many people who came down to help um, hand out information, talk about the garden. Um, the top left, you can see um, the artwork that was in that first temple, um, which has been, again, gifted to us. And we will find a suitable place for it, but really, really beautiful. Um, you can see June, who was uh, featured in our brochure, um, brochure talking about her gardening and her, her myeloma, that's the lady in green. And you can just see down there at the bottom, um, Fiona, who we'll meet later this evening. Um, however, the star of the show, other than obviously Chris, um, the tree with the slightly orangey red flowers um, won the Tree of the w Show Award, um, which is a slightly nerdy award to get, I think, but it was the tree that everyone was talking about. It's a type of horse chestnut, and apparently it's quite a rare variant. The main variant is normally red, and this one is a different, different version of it. So all of our passionate gardeners were very, very interested. And I think any, anyone who was volunteering down on the garden had more questions about that tree than any other plant. Um, but it was an amazing week. And I have to say, personally, it was very moving taking people through uh, the garden, giving them the story of the garden, which sort of starts with life before diagnosis, goes through diagnosis, goes through the experience. And then, as Chris says, at the end, near that water feature, you can just look back along the long vista of the garden and kind of metaphorically look back over life. So it was it was amazing. And I have to say, I, I personally took people through the garden who were absolutely in tears by, by the experience. Um, so a big shout out to everyone who helped us. Um, you know, we got some amazing coverage on the BBC, which is wonderful. We've had a huge engagement in social media. Um, and one evening when I was coming back from the garden, I had someone stop me on the tube and say, I saw you. Chelsea, you were on the Myeloma UK garden and then started to tell me all about myeloma. So that was my personal piece of awareness raising for the week. Um, so anyway, now let's um, let's move on. And I would like to introduce you to uh, Fiona. Um, Fiona is a wonderful woman who has myeloma and garden has, gardening has always been a passion of, of hers. Um, but after diagnosis, she found herself craving the peace and quiet of a garden even more than before. Um, so welcome, welcome, Fiona. It is lovely to see you again. I, I, I think we've been on a journey together through the, the Chelsea <laughs> process. Um, so um, first of all, could you just tell us a little bit about your gardening and how it has helped you and your well-being? Well, when I was diagnosed in 2016, and at that time, I would say that actually gardening was more of a chore. I was always doing because I had a very, very busy life. And when I was diagnosed, that kind of turned everything on its head. And I've had to rethink my approach to gardening. One of the things that's impacted is my, my strength, my general strength and stamina. I'm trying to find ways to be active. And for me, gardening is a very good way of doing that. Um, my approach is to do little and often. And um, there is always something to be done in the garden, but equally on those days when you don't feel 100%, we do get those days, you can just sit back and, and relax and enjoy the space. And I think that's probably the, the most important thing for me is actually learning to be in the movement and just, you know, as they say, smell the roses. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you were, you were at Chelsea and able to walk through our garden. Um, what, what, what were your impressions? What did you feel like in the garden? It was such a revitalising space. And I think that is the thing about gardening. It sort of rejuvenates you. It's that thing about engaging with the seasons. And I think Chris really reflected well the myeloma journey, the fact that we do go on this winding path and with the tree canopy, the light and shade, um, because with myeloma, you can have good and bad days and lots of people have to manage, you know, constant treatment, um, waiting for blood results, which is always creates a little bit of anxiety, you know, managing pain. And, and I think for, for me, it's the tiredness and actually have to manage yeah. that. And I think the garden really reflects that, the light and shade. But the most important thing I think that you've really got is that place 
um, the stillness, the water, and being, having a place to sit and just be and reflect. And he's very right about the water, the fact that listening to the water kind of shuts out all the noise. Yes, there was that quote he had, was he said, um, is it an Islamic quote that says, yes, if you can, can hear the sound of water, it cuts out the sound of chattering voices, which I thought was lovely. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. And certainly, you know, if you meditate, there's that thing about, you know, yeah. quite the mind and just shutting out, yeah, exactly about the chatter. So I think he actually got that really well. And it was just a beautiful space. And I particularly like the block planting. So when you were in the temple, you would look out through the arch and you would get a different vista and you would see, the, I mean, the, the white lilies were definitely my favourite. They were absolutely... Oh, they, yeah, they were gorgeous, weren't they? Gorgeous. Um, and you could see the sort of the block plans. And so, yes, it was a really inspirational space. Yeah. Oh, I'm so, it's so glad. I'm so glad to hear about how your gardening has given you that time and space. I think, you know, a lot, a lot of people feel that. Um, so what I'm going to do, Fiona, in a minute, I'm going, to say, I'm going to ask you what other things have helped you through your diagnosis. And for everyone here, maybe if you'd like to put into the chat, what are the, other, what are the things that help you maintain your, your well-being? It would be lovely for people to share that in the chat. Um, and just see what, what else helps people maintain their, their well-being. And Fiona, for you, what, what are the other things that have sort of helped you with your diagnosis? I would say everything that's creative, really. So I, I love to write, to write poetry, a journal. I find that's actually really helpful to help me process. Um, I knit and sew and quilt and bake. <laughs> Really, everything I like to make things, you know, jams with my produce from the garden and whatnot. So I would say anything that's really creative, um, because I suppose it's a little bit about feeling that you're leaving a bit of a legacy. Yeah. That you've no, actually that's, that's, created that's right. something that you can enjoy or other people can enjoy. So it, see, it sounds like you had a very full lockdown. <laughs> I did, and actually, in, in many ways, in lockdown, it, it sort of forced you to do that, didn't it? To have a yeah. bit of, a, um, yeah. and I, I, in many ways, having the illness, I was kind of used to it, but because yeah. you have periods when you don't feel that well, and so actually you have a day at home, etc., which is extended. <laughs> yeah. And have you have you been a part of a local support group or anything like that? Yes, I'm in my, my Loma support group, have been for a few years. I really, really value the, the space. Um, there are a lovely bunch of people um, out there at Stoke Mandeville. And I suppose what I enjoy about it is actually having a space where people understand what you're going through. It can feel a bit isolating. Um, I don't have any friends who happen to deal with an illness. And you can share there and we can support each other. And I think that really feels... Um, like a good thing to be able to do. Yeah, so, yeah. No, that's wonderful. And I think you've been um, you've been part of our peer buddy scheme as well, haven't you? Which is a yes, I do that. Um, to me, the myeloma it's a, it's like I'm a great one for community, and and I suppose I see it as a um, being able to support me, but also that I can participate, and that feels really important because you often feel when you're ill that your autonomy is taken away. So yes. Is when I saw them shouting out for people to be peer support buddies, I thought, yes, I'm sure I can do a bit of that. You know, seven years along um, on my journey, I, I feel I have something that, you know, to contribute. And being able to just listen to people, let them sort of work through how they want to manage their illness yeah. and the choices they want to make. And to just be able to sit alongside them and support them in that process because it's something we all have to do and it just feels a real privilege and if I could help one person that that feels like a good thing to be able to do. Oh that's brilliant Fiona well thank you so much for joining us this evening um, we may have some questions later um, but for the moment what I'm going to do is introduce Alice so I think she is going to magically pop up on screen with the wonders of Zoom um, Fiona's um, mentioned a couple of the uh, services that Marlow Mutech offers. Um, and so uh, Alice is now going to come and tell you a little bit more about those. Uh, so Alice, over to you.
Thank you, Sophie. Um, and thank you, Fiona. Um, before I start, I want to say a huge thank you to all the wonderful people who donate and support our work. Thanks to your contributions, Myeloma UK can provide the free resources I'm about to talk about um, for everyone in the Myeloma community. Um, and also just to say, you can find out more about everything that I'm talking about on our website. So I want to talk to you um, about the theme of this garden, a life worth living. That's something we're so passionate about at Milam UK and why we work not just to get access for more treatments for you, but kinder treatments um, and why we provide support for your quality of life as well. The garden Chris created was a great metaphor for living with myeloma. As Chris described, the initial formal border shields a woodland behind. And when you or a loved one is diagnosed with myeloma, you're stepping off this clear path, what you thought life would be like, um, and you're stepping into an unknown place. You're separated from life before and you're walking into the unknown. Um, and you can see that, that there's a start of a path that meanders further into the garden, but you don't know where it goes. But crucially, um, has, as has been said, the garden was designed as a gentle and beautiful woodland. It's not dark and gloomy. It's not a dense forest and dappled light shines through and flowers grow in the shade. And moving through, it shows something new at every step and it offers hope and restoration. And one of the key things that so many people have said about the garden is how peaceful and restorative it was. It was designed as a place to reflect and take in the beauty around you. And we want you to be able to have that peace and enjoyment in your everyday life. Myeloma can steal away that peace. You're taken into a world of appointments, treatments, hospitals, uncertainty and anxiety. Um, but you deserve to have a good quality of life and good well-being. So my question to you is, what are you filling your garden with? Have you got moments and, and support to help you feel restored? And who is in your garden with you? One of the main ways you can support your well-being is by having people in your life who you can talk to and feel connected with. And community is absolutely key. Humans are designed to be social. We're community minded creatures, um, but receiving a diagnosis can make you feel a bit isolated um, and alienated from the people in your life. We know myeloma can be very isolating. And I'm sure many of you won't have heard of myeloma before being diagnosed, let alone know anyone else living with it. Building community helps remove those barriers of isolation, and it's one of the biggest things you can do to improve your well-being. I'm sure almost all of us can remember a time when things have felt awful, but um, a call or a coffee with someone has absolutely changed your outlook. Um, people might not be able to fix all the challenges you face, uh, but knowing that others have gone through it before you and that you don't have to do it alone is incredibly powerful. And that's why we have several different support services that can help you connect with a community of people who understand what it's like stepping off the path and into an unknown. We're here and we want to connect you with the community so that the unknown is less scary. We know people operate differently, um, so we have different services, each one designed to connect you with people in a different way. So we have our discussion forum, for example, where you can post messages and read about people's experiences day or night. Um, and I do say night in particular because I know many of you will know what it's like to have a DEX night and be up at all hours. Um, and the forum is actually a really nice place to go to in those small hours and know that you're not alone in the, that experience. Um, another service we provide um, are our events. So our info days, um, they're not just a time to hear from experts and ask questions, but actually a lot of the feedback we get about them um, is about how positive and uplifting an experience it is um, because people are able to talk to other people living with myeloma. So we have two info days this year, Newcastle and London. Um, and Newcastle is actually coming up in just a couple of weeks time. So I would definitely encourage you to think about joining us for that. So the next support services I want to touch on are two that Fiona's actually already mentioned. Firstly, our support groups. So support groups are ready-made communities. Support groups um, offer more than just coffee and listening to a speaker. Um, as you'll be able to see, the quote on the next slide says uh, so much more than I could ever say. They provide the opportunity for you to sit side by side with people who really understand what it's like to go through life with myeloma. And you're a team, a community, um, and you're there to support 
each other, celebrate the high points together and comfort each other in the low points. You are there to share the wisdom your experiences have given you with one another. And as Fiona mentioned, you giving back, it's not just take, it's give and take between people. Um, there is space to be seen and heard and connected. Sometimes though, um, a more personal one-to-one -one approach is more suitable, which is where our peer buddy service comes in. So we'll match you with one of our buddies with um, a perspective and experience that's relevant to you. Talking one-to-one -one with another person gives you space to explore questions and understand how someone else has learned to live with their cancer. And this service has had such an impact on people accessing it and also on our, our buddies themselves, as Fiona said. Um, um, we ask people to rate their well-being before and after their time with their buddy. Um, we do this on a scale of 10 and Every, and uh, the average well-being increase is by, by over three points after people have spent time with their buddy. So you can see that actually it really is having a tangible effect on people's well-being. And one of the most amazing outcomes of these peer support services is how sharing knowledge and experience together can remind you who you are and how you can live well. Because talking to others can really help you remember you're a whole person. You're not just a patient or defined by this one aspect of life. Um, we know through many studies that have been going on that um, peer support can have absolutely transformative effects. Sometimes, though, life is really hard and no one would pretend otherwise. Sometimes it is just really difficult. And as Fiona said, there are good days and bad days. And being part of a community can really be of benefit. But sometimes we need a bit more help dealing with the stresses and anxieties of life. So I'd like to highlight an online tool that we have, um, which was created with people with myeloma and with psychological healthcare professionals. Our emotional wellbeing tool can be found on our website and it's designed to give you space and time to reflect on how your mental health is and guide you through exercises and support to help with it. It will also give you further tools and sources of support to help you um, and you can come back to it over and over as often as you need. Mental health, unfortunately, is not something that you can just tick off once and have done. Um, it needs work and support like your physical health does. As this patient says on this slide, um, information is power and learning through shared experiences is amazing. Um, and to complement that, we have such a depth and breadth of information resources available to you. Um, and we'll be here to help you navigate through them at the pace that's right for you so that you can use that information to improve your well-being and quality of life. We're here by phone and by email um, to ask questions, to process what's going on um, and have a space where you can just come as you are. Uh, you can come and get answers to the questions that maybe are keeping you up at night time or that you haven't had a chance to ask in clinic. Um, and sometimes it can be scary putting those questions out there. They're not questions you thought you'd have to face or things that you thought you'd ever have to know. Um, but we're here to support you through them. Our info line type team is here. Um, just give us a call or an email. We'll answer your questions. We'll be a listening ear and hold a space for you. So as I come to the end of this um, quick talk about our services, um, I encourage you to take the time to reflect yourselves and think about what a life worth living means to you and how you can bring the peace and restoration of this garden into your everyday life. Maybe it's um, time with your family or uh, it's out in the park, it's in the garden, maybe you're meeting a sport group for a coffee or you're just buying a nice bunch of flowers. Whatever it is that brings the small moments of joy into the everyday for you. And whatever it is, we're here right by your side. My name is here to make sure that you have a life worth living. We want to support your quality of life and make sure you're in a garden of beauty and joy and peace, um, not one of fear and anxiety. Your life should be in a beautiful woodland supported by moments of joy where beautiful things can grow in unexpected places and you find hope. And we're here with all of our information and support to help make that happen. So as I said at the start, you can find more about all of our services listed here um, on our website, or if you don't really know where to start, please do just give us a call and we'd love to help you through things.
if, thank you for listening to me. Um, I'll now hand back to Sophie for our Q&A time. And don't forget, if you've got more questions, please do pop them in the Q&A box. Thanks, Alice. Um, thank you. That was wonderful just to see all the, the range of everything that we've uh, got there to help support people both physically and with emotional um, well-being. Um, so now we're joined again by Fiona um, and it's really a time for you to ask your questions. Um, so please do um, pop them into the, into the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple for Alice. Um, so, uh, how do I find out about support groups near me? That is the first question. So, how can we help people find a support group? Yes, great. Um, well, first of all, I'd encourage you to go to our website. So, our lovely new website um, has a support groups page on it where you can see um, there's actually a map of um, the UK and where all of our support groups are on there. And you can filter them by whether they are meeting in person or online. Um, and yeah, so some of our support groups are in person, some of them are online only. So if you haven't got one in your area, um, I do encourage you to take a look at the online ones. Um, and then also, if you're interested in setting up a group, please get in touch because we'd love to support you with that as well. Thanks, thanks, Alice. Um, and, and yes, yeah, so, you know, if you, if you don't have a support group in your area, then we do have national support groups online. So take a look and see, find something that will work for you. Um, OK, then this one is also for you, Alice. How do I get a peer buddy? Great. Um, so, yes, you can go to our website, first of all, um, or you can give us a call. So we have an online form that you fill in um, and this helps us understand you are what you're trying to get out of the service and just to double check that you're suitable for the service because we want to make sure we're supporting you in the best way that we can and um, so if you hop onto our website fill those details in then someone in our team will get back to you and talk you through the rest of the process of course if you can't get on the website do just call us and we can do it with you on the phone thank you um oh a question here from mabel who's joined us on facebook will myeloma uk keep the tag a life worth living. I think it's brilliant. I guess that's probably a question for me, isn't it? I like it too. Um, we used it first last year um, as the title of a report that we published. Um, and that report was looking at the impact of delayed diagnosis. And that report we've used a lot with um, politicians, policy people to try and really improve um, times to diagnosis. So it's got a bit of a, a track record with us now having the garden as well. So I don't, I don't think it's gonna disappear overnight. I'm not making any promises, but I don't think it'll disappear um, over, overnight. Um, right, oh, right, a question here from Martin. Is the garden being moved and displayed somewhere? So yes, it is. And the, um, the afterlife of the garden is wonderful. So um, the big trees that you see uh, so, so, and some of the hedging, and one of the trees is going to the Beetson, which is a cancer centre in Glasgow, and the others are all going to um, Horizon crematoriums that provide gardens of rest. And they are start, starting a new garden of rest and the trees are going there. Um, they've been really supportive for, to us. They've funded the shipping and the transport of all the trees. And it never, I never knew how much work and effort it was to transport trees up the A1. Um, but anyway, they are, they are going there. Um, and then the rest of the garden, the, the smaller plants and stuff, is being kept together as a garden. Um, a very generous donor has given us a donation for the rest of those plants. So basically most of the big plants will have public life in other quiet, serene places um, and the other plants are being kept together. So good, good question there. Um, let's see, what other questions have we got? Oh, yes. So let's have one here for Fiona. This is a very open one. What brings you joy, Fiona? I think you may have told about that as already. So what are the things that make you really joyful? Well, apart from my garden, it's my two children. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. That's very good. Uh, oh, Dr. Suter from the Beatson has said thanks for the tree in the chat. Our pleasure. I hope you enjoy the tree. It's heading your way very soon. In fact, it may be heading, heading your way this, this week. 
Um, mm, what else have we got here? Okay, another one for you, Fiona. Um, obviously, a, a life worth living seems to be a, um, a line that's resonating with people. Um, what does it mean to you, a life worth living? Well, I think it means that you don't become your diagnosis, that actually you incorporate your um, treatment within your life. And it's just one of the things that you do and you don't focus on it too much. Um, no. And I think that's what it would mean to me. Yeah. And I think that's when we, um, when we first started using that with the report last year. I think it was very much helping people to think um, that you know everyone is a person and you may be living with myeloma, but if you're a person, you're not a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. so I think, Fiona, I think that's a really good, I think that's a really good place for us to close out the questions. I'm gonna give one more shout out for anybody else who's got questions or anybody else who wants to talk about trees. It has been a, a, a week of trees. Okay. Well, I think if that's the end of the questions, then <clears throat> I think really we've come to uh, the end of our time together this evening. I hope you've give, we've given you a real feel of what the garden was like. It's been the most amazing um, experience for us as an organisation, as a platform to raise awareness, both of myeloma and, and of us. So um, thank you hugely to Fiona um, and to Alice being here this evening. Thank you again to Chris for the garden and for Project Giving Back to gifting this to us. Um, everyone who registered at the event uh, will get a summary of all our services and how you can access them. So don't worry if you've missed that um, in, in the chat. Um, and I think what I hope we've managed to convey to you this evening is that we are here for everybody who is affected by myeloma. Um, we want to make sure everyone has an empowered present and a hopeful future. And obviously our ultimate goal is a cure. So, you know, in addition to the services that we've talked about um, tonight, as I'm sure you all know, we're investing in innovative life-saving research and doing a lot of work to advocate to make sure that um, everyone has access to the new um, treatments as, as they come online. Um, as a charity, we receive no government funding or NHS funding, so we are entirely reliant on the generous support of the people who work, who support us. Uh, and I can only say a really deep thank you for everyone who has. If you can consider making a donation or setting up a regular gift to support our work, we would be really grateful for that. Together, we are absolutely making myeloma history. And thank you again for joining us tonight. And good night. Have good evenings.